Okay, well, I think we're rolling around here to seven, so I'll go ahead and get this kicked off. Thank you all for joining us tonight for this virtual apple tasting event with the Wenatchee Museum. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank, thank a moment to thank CMI Orchards and Stim Milt, who both graciously donated the boxes of apples for this virtual tasting, and that means that 100% of your ticket sales for tonight's event went to support the museum. So thank you for purchasing tickets to this event and for participating at home. I also wanna say hi to all of our museum members. If you're not already a member, I invite you to join us. We've got great virtual events, online classes and virtual tours. And once we're able to reopen our doors, we offer great rotating exhibits and educational programs and fun community events year round. So here at the museum, our job is to gather with the community to engage and to educate and tonight we have the opportunity to meet virtually to learn about what makes Wenatchee so special, our apples. So thanks for logging into this tasting to learn what makes varieties of apples different. First, I wanna introduce you to our host tonight. Uh, the, we're joined by Brian Danes from the museum's board of directors. Brian's a longtime Wenatchee resident who's new to the museum's board this year. And he's the controller at Blue Star Growers, a local pear and apple packing cooperative. And Brian and I are joined by Danielle Huber, the marketing specialist at CMI Orchards. Danielle, we can't wait to dig in. Uh, tell us where you'd like to get started. Well, um, so you all should have gotten an email from Jill that laid out the order that we're going to do our tasting. Um, there is a reason we do that and it's um, actually more important than you would think. So each apple has their very own taste profile um, they go from sweet and mild all the way up to super tart, which you guys are probably familiar with already at the Granny Smith. So we'll start with the, on the mild side and the sweet, and then we'll work our, our way to the tart so that we can capture, hopefully capture each apple's um, unique flavor profile. So first we're gonna start with the ambrosia apple. So if you guys wanna get that out, hopefully everybody has their apples rinsed off or washed off. Um, and or you either have them marked or you left your stickers on so you can tell which is which. All right, so this is a pretty red one with a gold label. Yeah, the cool thing about ambrosia apples, and um, this one's not a, a good specimen, but hopefully you guys have one, but you might see these yellow spots and it kind of looks like it's airbrushed. That's actually where the leaf of the tree covered the apple and the sunlight didn't get to it, so it didn't, it didn't get fully red. Um, so those cool kind of airbrush colors are all simply just a little, a leaf shadow, basically. Is that special to ambrosia or similar for other types of apples too? Um, it shows up really well on ambrosia and then we'll get to the consies too. It does it on the consies as well, but um, for some reason the ambrosias really, really show that, that leaf spot. Okay, I'm just cutting my apples, sorry. So the cool thing about um, Ambrosia and CMI Orchards is that we were invited by the growers in Canada um, specifically to bring and grow market and actually bring the variety to the United States back in 2007. So um, the McDougal and Sons family, or McDougal family, which I'm sure most of you have um, heard of if you're from the area, were asked to um, cultivate it here, try to bring it to market. Um, it took us about 17 years to get it and it was, or 17 years to get it to be the number one branded apple variety. Um, unfortunately, the, the people who discovered Ambrosia did not uh, trademark the name. So the patent was up in Canada in 2015 and now is up in the US in 2017. So anybody can grow ambrosia now. It's not a special apple any longer. You can go buy a tree, plant it in your backyard. Um, all of the Washington shippers can grow it and sell it and, um, and put it on the market. So if you wanna go ahead and- Thanks for sharing that with us. I also noticed that um, Jill is starting to put some fun facts or some trivia into our chat. So if you guys have any questions for Danielle um, or for me, feel free to put that in um, chat or in Q&A um, and, and try to answer Jill's questions too. Go ahead and yeah, try your ambrosia. Should be really light and crisp and airy. Um, 
some people say they taste a, a honey note, like a honey sweetness as opposed to a fruity sugary one. So um, that's kind of our, when we describe ambrosia, we say it with sweet like honey. Um, it is sweet. It had a great cr crunch too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, um, we're really actually, so the, the one that you had, you probably saw on the sticker, we called it ambrosia gold. That's a rebrand of CMI Orchards. We call it that because we kind of we we liken ourselves to the gold standard for the ambrosia apples since we're kind of the experts now. Um, Scott McDougall has it down to an exact six-day window that he picks these apples off the tree because he knows that's when they're the best. Um, he takes pride in ambrosia, and um, we do too. So that's our ambrosia apple. It's it was a chance seedling. It was just something that a grower up in BC, Canada found um, in their Golden Delicious orchard. So it was a cross of, of another kind of delicious apple um, and a golden is what we're thinking, but we don't really know the parentage. So it was definitely, it was just a chance seedling that one. Oh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. So you said there's a six day window. Do all apples kind of ripen at the same time? Is it based on weather or, or is it based on variety? Yep, it is definitely based on weather for all of those things. Um, the, the one thing that growers need to do is carefully plan their plantings so that their labor force and their, their pickers have time to get the apples off the tree all in that window. Um, harvest starts with Honeycrisp as early and Gala as early as like mid-August. We started August 10th this year. Oh, that's early. And then, yeah, and then it goes all the way to mid-November sometimes, depending on, you know, if it freezes. Last year, we got a freeze, and so some of our pink lady apples and um, red delicious apples had a, had a bit of freeze damage. But, um, yeah, it's all, it, all varieties ripen at different times, which is great for the grower because then, it can, then they can plan their, their picking strategy. That was delicious. I did the most awkward job cutting that. I was trying, trying to preserve it so I can share it with my kids later and oh, yeah. tell them about what I learned. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did a very strange job over here, so. We, we found these great slices. Oh, yeah. I didn't use it, but they're nice because they're like a 16 slice. They're on Amazon. Oh, I'll get them. But 16 slice. Yeah, I always, what do I have? The six one and then I cut them in half again. <laughs> yeah. That's what most people do, but those are great for like demos and stuff so we can yeah. get uh, more varieties out of it. Okay, are we ready to move on to Fuji? Nobody has any ambrosia questions? I'm not seeing any, no. Cool. Okay, so you guys are probably familiar with the Fuji apple. Um, you'll, you won't be surprised to hear that it <laughs> rains from Japan. Um, so this is one of the sweeter apples. Uh, one of the things we talked about before that um, you guys should know is that what makes an apple sweet versus what makes it tart or mild, um, they actually, we measure sugars called bricks. So in order to determine when an apple is ready to be picked, or you know, how much storage it needs. We measure things like bri bricks and starch, um, pressures, all those things come into play to decide when the apples are ready to be harvested. So Fuji's have a really high bricks. So that's the sugar count. And um, I think it's, I wanna say it's between uh, 12 and 15 bricks for Fuji and a normal apple is maybe 10 or 12. Um, and then you know, the more tart you get, the less bricks there are. And Daniel, we have a question in comments about how we know which one is, is the Fuji. And I'm so glad someone asked that because I'm doing some guessing over here. I had a couple without labels. Okay. Um, well, I cut mine, but it, sometimes they are a little bit odd. This, mine says it was um, donated by Stemilt and it had a Fuji sticker on it. But if yours doesn't, another apple that didn't have a sticker was the Honeycrisp and it was a little bit smaller. So that might, that might be a... A hint, um, my Fuji was, see, this is the problem we have in grocery stores because all the apples look the same and how are we supposed to tell them apart, right? So um, I only had two that didn't have labels and I did it process of elimination. I knew the Honeycrisp didn't. And then my Fuji, I yes. think this is the right one, is very, it's, it's really quite red. I was um, actually yeah. thinking it was gonna be a different variety. 
sometimes they'll have the stripes on them if they're a high grade Fuji, but definitely these ones, yeah, it's red and it's got some, I guess some, it's not like the discoloration, like what was on the Ambrosia, but kind of looks like, I'll hold it close. Can you see like the discoloration there? I'll call it discoloration. That's not the proper word, but they're not the prettiest apple, but they taste really good. They do. They were a little hard to cut into uh, as well. Different uh, texture somehow. Mm -hmm. They're definitely a little bit more, for, the skin's a little tougher. Um, well, hopefully that person was able to figure out which is which. Good. Yes, thank you. Okay, so cheers. Let's try the Fujis. Okay. The Fujis are a lot, they should be a lot more sweet more of that sugar taste as opposed to the honey sweetness or the mild that we did with the ambrosia. Um, I can really tell the difference when you said honey sweet just was sweet then, but now without that, I can tell the difference there. Yeah, even if you guys have your ambrosia ones handy, you could go back and kind of remind yourself of the difference of the sweetness because it's not something that you generally think of if you just bite into an apple, but when you're comparing them, it's kind of fun to... So I remember this apple being super popular um, as I was growing up here. Is it still very popular and is it as, as popular in our area or kind of around the world? It's definitely popular around the world. Um, it's not as popular as it was when it first came out. Um, it's a little bit difficult to grow and keep because people love a good looking piece of fruit, right? And Fujis are kind of ugly by nature, but um, you can get really beautiful ones too. It's just the coloring can be a little off sometimes. Um, so the pack out for growers isn't amazing, but um, it's a fairly easy apple to grow on the trellis system or on the tree. Um, I think it's, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that it's the third or fourth most popular apple as far as, far as volume goes out of Washington State, um, both organic and conventionally grown. Gala's number one, it surpassed Red Delicious a couple years ago. Um, so I think, and then of course, Honeycrisp, and then I think it's Fuji after that. So okay. it's definitely popular. It's, we export it. Um, it's it, the, in the Asian cultures, they love it because they just really love that sweet treat. And they generally grow on the bigger end um, and sharing fruit overseas is something that other cultures do constantly. If you're going to someone's house, um, if you need to bring a dessert, bringing an apple or even an orange is not uncommon at all. That's interesting. I always feel like I need to bake something, which leads me to my next question. Are, are either of these apples that we've tasted, the Ambrosia or the Fuji, a baking apple or a cooking apple or just a snacking? What types of uses, uses do you recommend for these? You can cook with any apple. Um, when it comes to desserts, we're probably, it's gonna be later in the spectrum when we get down to the uh, more tart apples, because um, you like to add cinnamon and sugar and oats and all the yummy stuff that we put in the baking apples. Um, we do have a Fuji grilled cheese sandwich that we make at trade shows and stuff that's really good, which is weird. Yeah, but if you use a really good cheese and some hearty bread um, and just thinly slice the Fujis in it, it's really good because they're, they're sweet, but they're not too um, dense. So they- they oh, I wanna try really, that. Yeah, it's really Do you really roast good. them first or do you just really thinly slice them and put them right? Yeah, thin slice, put them on while it's grilling on both sides so it heats up a little bit. It, it ends up being really well or really good. Um, and ambrosias, we, we generally use in like a Waldorf salad or um, maybe dipped in almond butter or peanut butter, just because it's more of that honey flavor. It's, just, it's not bold enough, I think, to put into a, a pie or a dessert. I haven't tried it in applesauce. That might be good because you're going to add some stuff to it there. But um, I think anything in applesauce is good. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably true. All right, so now I'm cutting into my smitten. This one's going to be really dense if you got good ones. <laughs> yep, that's the one. That, yeah, has the label on it. Nice color. So this apple was actually found um, in New Zealand. It was bred by a 
company called Pegasus. They're an apple breeding company. They also um, discovered the Envy apple, which you might have heard of, or the um, Jazz apple. That's mm -hmm. another one. So, and that now different growers handle those varieties, but um, Pegasus is basically an apple breeding um, entity in New Zealand, and they discovered smitten. It's actually, or actually, I should not say discovered, they bred smitten, and it's a cross between Braeburn and Gala. Mm. So they do um, crossbreeding, which sounds scientific, kind of is, but it's Tell not like about that. Apples is, is really scientific now. I mean, right? It's yeah. Yeah, it's not, we're, they're not making them in petri dishes, but they do um, cross pollinate. So that's how they breed an apple. They'll take pollination from a Braeburn tree and a Gala tree. But out of that, you might get five, six different, we actually have two other varieties, one on this list that we're trying today that are also Braeburn Gala crosses, but they taste totally different. So it just matters, I guess, you know, just like you have any other parents, two, two parents make a baby, the babies aren't gonna be the same, right? I have never had a smitten apple before. It's delicious and totally different than the ones we tasted before. Very we have, yeah, we have a great question in chat asking um, if the apples we're tasting were picked this year or from last year's crop. So yes, great question. Most, all of these except for Konzi, and I was gonna explain that to you guys when we got to it. So we actually, um, CMI has an import program with Chilean growers. Conzi's a newer apple and we don't harvest these until for another probably week, maybe 10 days. Um, so we couldn't get them to you guys in time. So we brought in what we do for our customers. When we sell apples, we, we like to have a year round program so those apples that we don't have year round here from Wenatchee or Yakima, Washington State, um, we will bring, we partner with people overseas and we'll bring in imports. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the origin of Kanzi and how we work with our import partners when we get to it. But Smitten, for example, is one that we only have um, product that will last us through about mid-February. So we'll actually work with growers in New Zealand and bring it up to the States so that it stays in the store for our customers and they're not having to pull it off the shelves and then consumers forget what it tastes like and then it comes back out and they're like, what's that again? It's, we don't like to reintroduce it repeatedly. We like to make sure everybody has um, volume at hand. That smitten was delicious. What types of uses um, do people find for that? Snacking, baking, sauce? Salads. Salads are great. Um, baking, yes. Not, it's not one of the attributes that we list, but we, um, you definitely can because it's so dense. It keeps its uh, texture, I guess. You know, some, I don't know how many people like mushy apples when they bake, but I'm not one of them. I like, a little, I like to know it's a little bit of an apple. Um, so it'll keep its, its texture a little bit more because it's so, it's so dense. Um, and, and hard. I don't know if you guys noticed that probably cutting it in or just right when you bite it. There's a lot of, there's a lot to it. I cut that one very awkwardly. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's totally fine. So tell us about texture. You've talked about density, um, crispness, that sort of thing. Are, are these all a little bit different? Yes. I, well, you probably notice, and you'll notice again when we get to the honey crisp too. Um, so you probably notice the ambrosia was mild, and I'd call it, I don't want to call it soft, but it, it's definitely um, not as crisp and light as um, some of the other varieties, but it's a great just like go-to apple. Um, and then your Fuji was a little bit more airy. Honeycrisp is a little bit airy. Smitten, I would consider dense. Um, I don't know how to, it's just like the cellular structure. So if you push on the smitten, you're not gonna get anywhere. I don't know if you wanna try that. Um, but if you do it to the ambrosia, you'll feel it, or even the Fuji, you'll feel it dent, dent a little bit. You can crush it. Yeah, I can feel that. That's interesting. So different cellular structure, um, Braeburn, one of the parents is a very, very dense apple. And then, well, we'll just get into it. So Gala is our next apple. This is one of the um, parents of 
of smitten. So this one won't be, it's not gonna be mushy, but it won't be as dense as what a Braeburn would be or actually probably what the smitten was. So you can go ahead and cut the gala. The gala is the number one um, apple in Washington state as far as volume goes. It goes all over the world. Um, like I said, it surpassed, it surpassed, uh, sorry, I'm giving apple slices to my children too. <laughs> um, it surpassed the Red Delicious apple, I want to say three years ago. It might have only been two, it might have been four, but it was kind of a big deal because that's, um, as you guys probably know, the Red Delicious apple from Washington State has been its flagship apple for, gosh, a hundred years. And um, old school, yeah. And it's something that we, the Red Delicious, we ship all over the world. Um, and it's still the number one exported apple. So for Gala to take over that in volume, because every store wants it, has it, everybody likes it. it's kind of like the go-to. It's the it's like the white bread, right? It's just like describe me a Gala. It's totally fine. You'll grab it at 7-Eleven, hotel um, lobbies. You know, everybody's got them. This apple is beautiful too. It's beautifully red, and it's um, got mm -hmm. interesting color. Does the color of an apple really? indicate anything about its flavor or is it just for different all different okay it doesn't but people will pay more for pleasing to the eye yeah right yeah we have we have a program called um imperfect but it looks like i am perfect so it's just got blemishes or um you know the colors not just so we can still sell it and people will hopefully still buy it but um i think real produce people know that some of the best tasting fruit is the ugliest um but retailers and your everyday person would rather have the most beautiful apple on their shelf somebody you know will judge you probably go through and pick out your your thing your produce um by looks right we all do it i do it and i know better and i still do it <laughs> you want the pretty stuff so um no color and for the most part, appearance generally doesn't have, if it's a good apple, it's a good apple. Okay. We all pick the good stuff, right? Yeah, that's Gala. So the texture on this one is really different. And this one's never been my favorite because I almost want to describe it as a little bit mushy. Is that it's just me? No, and that's kind of what I was saying. It's the cell structure is so different than a Braeburn. And um, you can do that test again too. And it's Similar to, that's how I feel about Red Delicious or Golden Delicious. Um, can you guys go let those people know that we're in here? Oops. Um, so yeah, no, that's, and that's probably, you wouldn't want to cross a really, really firm, dense apple with another really firm, dense apple, because if you can't get your teeth through it, then what's the enjoy, the, you know, that's not right. going to be great. Right. Um, but I totally agree. Um, and I always thought it's because I, I'm kind of an apple slot snob these days. I don't really care for Gala's or Red Delicious because there's so much better stuff out there now. I feel the same way. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah. I know when people say, oh, Washington State, I love your Red Delicious. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but there's a place for it. There's a place for it, you know? All right. So are we ready to move on to Honeycrisp? I think so. Probably everybody's favorite. So I just as a reminder, this was the apple without a label on it. Yep. Yeah. And this is beautifully small, but these are my favorite. So I buy these at home and they are, I mean, they come just absolutely enormous. Yeah. <laughs> the store, are apples getting bigger every year? What is the deal? Um, well, there's just varieties that tend to grow larger than others. Fuji's one, Honeycrisp is another. This, I was actually shocked when I got my bag too, because I was like, oh, that's a small Honeycrisp. It's, <laughs> these are the kinds, there's room for all sizes. Um, when we're selling to our customers, these are the kinds that we'll put in pouch bags or poly bags or tote bags. Um, especially now we're seeing these trends with COVID that people are doing more online shopping. They're going to the store less. So they actually prefer their fruit in a bag. They can just pop in, grab a three pound bag and then throw it in the cart and go. Or, um, you know, maybe they're having Instacart shop for them or Oh, that's interesting. So has that changed how you pack and present them to customers then? A hundred percent. We were oh. actually working on, 
you know, we were working on sustainable packaging. We were trying to go away from plastic and, um, you know, all of the bad things for earth. And that was what our customers, which is the retailers, so your Safeway and your Fred Meyers, and they were asking us to do is find other ways to package the fruit that wasn't so bad on the earth. Um, but ever since COVID, there, people actually want it in a bag because it's protected and there less people are touching it, you know. It's so tricky. We just had an um, environmental film with Sustainable Wenatchee and the Wenatchee mm. River Institute, and we talked about the story of plastic, which is, uh, I mean, just a devastating um, environmental film, but, um, but very interesting. And it, it, I feel like there's so many strides that we were making in the right direction that have yeah. set us back recently. So that's interesting to know. Yeah, it definitely took a back seat. I'm, I'm sorry I missed that talk. I'm, it's so interesting how the perception of, there, you know, there's different kinds of plastics and recyclable ones and um, just the perception of us putting things in a fiber tray that's compostable, but the carbon footprint that it takes to make that tray is actually less or more impactful on our earth than the plastic and then you know number one PET that's fully recyclable so it's it's a trade-off and it's all so confusing and there's certain places where you can recycle certain kinds of plastic and not others and it's very interesting yeah. I've read that the Wenatchee or the Wenatchee Valley um, are leaders in safe harvest and in handling. I think that's more related to pesticide, but um, you know, as that comes into environmental sustainability, how are we doing there? Um, no, I think that's our Washington apple industry across the board. Uh, that is something that farmers and all of us care deeply about. Um, having reusable materials, like even down to the material that we lay down on the floor of the orchard to, so we'll put, you've probably drove by orchards and seen the white cloth. Yes, what is that? So at, right before harvest, you know, uh, 10 days, two weeks before harvest, we'll lay that cloth down so that the sunlight will, will reach the fruit underneath the trees. It's getting that leaf cover so that you can get that beautiful color that everybody likes. Yeah, like I, oh, if, that's so interesting. I've always wondered, I'm glad you said that. Sometimes it's even like a almost a foil or a reflective yeah the my that's mylar and that one is not as sustainable as the cloth but it's a lot less expensive so if depending on the farmers um you know you just never know what financial situation they're in um so they it's a trade-off right so it can it, what used to cost farmers with the old way of planting i don't know what the cost per acre was back then but now it's about for just an average apple is $30,000 an acre. So if you can imagine a farmer having to go um, to the bank and say, hey, I'm gonna plant this orchard. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna grow fruit and it'll be good. I might have some fruit in three years and then I could probably start paying you in five. It just, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> so it, things are definitely, the growing practices have changed they're a lot more expensive than they used to be. That is that is very interesting. We have a question in chat that just disappeared. Let's see. Asking if apples have caffeine. Um, no, but they are said to give as much energy as a cup of coffee, but there's okay. not naturally caffeine in them. Interesting. Yeah, that is something that I've heard. If you eat an apple, replace a cup of coffee, it will give you the same amount of energy. I can't I I'm that to try that. No. Yeah, I found that to be true, but that's what they say. <laughs> with uh, helping kids from home right now and all of the other things I have to deal with, coffee is what's getting me through. So. Yeah, I feel that. I'll let someone else try that. So I love the honey crisp. This is absolutely delicious and a personal favorite for sure. Yeah, that one's definitely, um, I think, become quickly becoming the U.S. favorite. And that was discovered um, in the uh, University of Minnesota. So that actually brings us to Sweet Tango, that one. This is not one I've tried. I'm excited to try this one. Yeah, so this one um, is from a Honeycrisp and Zestar. So Zestar is another branded apple um, that didn't quite make it through the trial phase, but they, uh, the same man that invented or bred the Honeycrisp apple did this one. 
So I'm bound to love it. Yeah. So this one in, in Wenatchee um, is grown by Stemilt. So I don't know how, if you guys, how, how much you guys know about proprietary varieties and branded apples versus. Um, no, tell apples. us about that. Yeah. So the branded apples um, are ones that only specific growers are allowed to grow. Um, so like at CMI, we have Kiku, Kanzi, Ambrosia, Jazz, Envy, Pacific Rose, Evercrisp, and Cosmic Crisp, right? Okay, so that's eight. That's unheard of. Like we, we definitely put a lot of our time and effort in those branded varieties. Um, and then your core varieties would be Reds, Goldens, Grannies, Fujis, that, the one that everybody knows, everybody loves, every grocery store wants. Um, and now, well, with Cosmic Crisp, that's something, and I wish we could have gotten Cosmic Crisp, but we're just, just starting out, and so we don't, not everybody has them. Um, so that one will be open to all Washington growers eventually. There was a lottery the first couple years, so some have more trees than others, but uh, as soon, that, that what one. varieties are grown here locally? What varieties? How many? Oh, how many? Oh, all of them. Yeah, all of them. What, yeah. Makes, what makes Wenatchee so special? So we grew up hearing that we were the apple capital of the world. Yeah. You still and get it, to claim that title? We, well, depends on how you looked at it. We like to think that we grow the best ones, but when it comes to acreage, it's actually Yakima. Yakima has a lot more acreage of orchards than Wenatchee does. So if we um, widen our geographic area, then we can still claim it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we still grow the best ones. <laughs> so how it um and it works out really well because we our growing region if you're looking at a map of washington state it's right up the middle it's right at the foothills of the cascades it goes right up the columbia river for irrigation um and it goes from the border all the way down to the border of oregon and we grow apples pears and cherries all along there and there's something about that volcanic ash soil um, our climate is, is conducive to growing organic fruit unlike anywhere else in the United States. So and I live here because of the four seasons and the apples <laughs> like it too, huh? Yes, yeah. yeah. Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, those are all three really big apple growing regions. None of them can grow um, organics because they are so humid or there's the temperatures are not quite there so little we'll call we call them pests but it's like molds and, and um, funguses and mildews will grow in those settings and they won't grow here because it's you know 98 105 in the day and then it'll drop down to 60 mid 50s at night and that you burn them off and then freeze them out <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so that's really why Washington can and does grow the best fruit in our, you know, our valley is just um, right there with the Columbia River and makes it so much easier um, and accessible for irrigation. Yeah, so did, let's taste the sweet tango. Yeah. Okay, I haven't had this in like three years. Hmm, that's a little tart at the end. Mm -hmm. So there, I know this is grown. Um, there's a Minnesota grower, Stemelt here in our valley. And then there is an East Coast grower, which I don't remember what state, I wanna say New York. They all have partnerships. So they're allowed to grow sweet tangle. So this is one that's big all over the US. Like you'll see, you know how we like our, our local fruit, our local grown um, varieties, or if you, if you know it came from Wenatchee, it's just something better about that when you purchase it, right? So they, they do the same thing in Michigan and um, all across the US. So if it's local fruit, like the sweet tango, they love it. They absolutely love it and they'll buy it until it's all gone. We have a question about um, Camino apples. Um, someone says that they haven't seen those for a few years, but they were popular for a while. I'm guessing it's Cameo. Oh, yep, I bet so. Yep, okay. so. They are still around. They're not grown commercial, commercially much anymore. Um, CMI has, no longer has any cameo old orchards. 
that was supposed to be the next big thing. It was one that um, everybody loved. And honestly, it's not a bad apple. I don't, I, I think it was maybe the look wasn't that great. Um, it just didn't do well out in the market. I think similar, so I don't know if we have any people who have family or grew up in the New York area, but there's Macintosh apples mm, yes. and Portland apples. Are Those ones are not ones that us Washingtonians would be like, wow, that's a great apple. We were like that with the cameos. Um, and the rest of the country was not. <laughs> we tried. There was even a cameo marketing um, like organization that, that just did, worked on cameo apples and getting it to market and it just never really took off. So because I, because it's when actually I have to ask this question. Um, we learned in our Apple Blossom Centennial exhibit at the museum, they, they were celebrating 100 years of the Apple Blossom Festival, mm -hmm. that the um, royalty used to go around the world and market Washington or Wenatchee apples. Yeah. So tell me about Apple marketing now. You talked about the cameo marketing um, yeah. process cool. now that we're not sending our royalty off around the world. Yeah. Um, so I... My background, I actually got to work with the Washington Apple Commission before I was at CMI Orchard. So I did export marketing. Um, I handled Southeast Asia and Canada. So I was able to see this firsthand and it sounds, we're so spoiled here, right? We get apples all year round. They're at our fingertips. Um, they cherish Washington apples. Like our Washington Apple logo has, I fought copyright infringement it would look exactly like the Washington Apple logo, but it would say Washington just to like sneak it. I mean, you guys have all probably seen the Jimmy Choo knockoff purses that they sell in Hong Kong. Well, they do that with our apples over there. And I'm like, I was flabbergasted. Um, so we do, we do market, do marketing overseas. A lot of that marketing is towards like the wholesale market. So there's still a little bit, I'll, call, I'll say old school, with the way uh, retailers get their fruit, they'll actually go to the market, pick out whatever stand they think has the best fruit, and then take it to the grocery store or their fruit shop. Um, here in the US, we it's a little bit different. We're not marketing to consumers. We're marketing to our customers or the retailers. So we will um, make sure that our, we'll do press releases or you know, buyer ads. So our, our buyers for the retail, your Safeway, your, I mean, there's hundreds of retail banners, right? Um, you have to market to the buyer before you can market to the consumer. So if, if the consumer knows Conzi Apple and knows they love it, but they can't find it on the shelf, um, then it doesn't really do us any good. So I don't, for, if for any marketing gurus out there, we call it B2B marketing. So it's business to business marketing. And that's a really big focus for a lot of us shippers because um, the, the consumer stuff is the fun stuff, but if it's not on the shelf, it's, it's not a good spend of our growers money. If that that's makes really sense. interesting. Yeah. So that was Sweet Tango. It was absolutely yep. delicious. What do we have next on our list? Okay. So next is Konzi, and this is the one, this is also a Braeburn Gala mix. And this is the one that we brought from Chile. Um, and I'm sorry we didn't have local fruit for you all, but it's just kind of a newer apple and we're not harvesting. But you get to taste what an apple from Chile tastes like and I, it's just as good as one from Washington. And it, um, the cool thing, so Conzi was actually um, discovered in Belgium and it is the number two branded apple all over the world, or I'm sorry, in Europe and in Asia, but not, it's, it's hasn't hit the US yet as it has in other areas. So um, you've probably heard of Pink Lady apples. Pink Lady is the number one branded apple in the world. Conzi is number two. So um, Conzi is a little bit tart. This, this one is a great, great, great baking apple. So if you want to make a pie or a crisp or a tart, we always do our baking with Conzi apples. Um, it also holds the, holds the texture like we like and um, it just has a little bit more of that acid so you can add more sugar. And um, yeah. I 
could see it being really versatile that way. Tasting wise, it's not my favorite. I, I think yeah. I've passed my, yeah, my sweet spot there, but. <laughs> it's more, yeah, it's definitely less sweet, more tart. Mm. I find it, um, and this one's not as bold as I've tasted before, but they generally bite in and they're like, kind of do that sour face. Yeah. And then it, and then it kind of uh, melts. Yeah. Out. Yeah. You're right. But the second bite was delicious. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a sweet apple. I like, I like, I like Fuji's. I like Envy. I like Smitten. Um, but for baking, it's good. You talked a little bit about, um, apple grading. Um, so our apple industry exhibit talks about growers, how they've marketed their apples using like colored labels that, that talked about the grading of the apples. How are apples graded now? So Washington state actually has more stringent grading standards than the United States. So we've got the WSDA and we've got the USDA in the warehouses, um, you know, just kind of auditing and check and balancing, making sure that we're meeting those standards. Um, there are so many grades, I couldn't even begin to tell you all of them. Uh, there's extra fancy, there's fancy, there's uh, Washington number one premium. Um, so they go from the best of the best where people, like for Honeycrisp, they'll pay over $80 a box for Honeycrisp, um, or they can get like a lesser grade or maybe it's smaller fruit or the color's not there, the pressures aren't great. You know, there's all these things that they put into grading. Um, and you'll, you can, you know, obviously pay less for that less, lesser quality fruit or it goes into a bag. Um, the, the branded varieties like Kanzi or Ambrosia or Sweet Tango, they have to meet specific grades to even be called that variety. Okay. So if they don't meet whatever that brand's specs are, they can't sell it. So it's really important for growers to meet those, those expectations so that they can get their, you know, their return, their grower return for their money. That's interesting. Thank you. And then it, that provides continuity, obviously, all over the world. So if you're getting fruit from Chile or if you're getting fruit from New Zealand, it's supposed to all taste the same because it all fits those specs. I think right. we're our way all the way through. Are we to Granny Smith? We are. I don't know if any of you live near orchards, but I'm blessed and live in the middle of, I have peaches on one side, cherries on another, Fuji's on another and Golden Delicious is on another. <laughs> so I'm surrounded by four different orchards and we're not doing, I know we're not doing um, Golden Delicious, but there's something about Granny's and Golden Delicious right off the tree that I get it. Like I will eat a, a Golden Delicious out of the store and be like, I don't understand why this is even an option for people to purchase. This is not good. But right off the tree, man, they're so good. And I feel like grannies are the same. I agree. Yes, we live next to an orchard. It's really fun to watch the progress and um, watch the work. And man, it's a lot of work. And there's a huge industry to support it. Um, yes. All right, Granny Smith, get ready to pucker up. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are laughing at me for saying that. <laughs> that was not so bad. Mine wasn't so sour. Maybe, maybe after tasting others, you eased us into it. Yeah. But yeah, okay. they sure can be. So tell me about what we want to use Granny Smith for. Yeah, we love to use Granny's for um, caramel apples, uh, obviously baking. They're great for applesauce and pies and tarts and crumbles. And um, they are great if you make homemade cider or juice and you mix a granny with a sweeter variety and it balances it out that's always uh, that. yeah so I don't know if you guys we have a cider press that we rent every now and then and um you can just mix the different varieties and you know make different tasting juices or cider um 
Yeah, but it's a huge caramel apple thing. I'm sure everybody has made their homemade caramel apples out of Granny Smith's. Um, they're great in salads too. They, they add a nice little texture, a nice little um, tart bite in a salad. Really, they're, they're can, you, grannies are, you can use them for anything. <laughs> that was absolutely delicious. I want to invite um, anyone who has any final questions for Danielle to share those in chat with us. Um, I'm just really appreciative that you were able to join us tonight. Thank you again for donating apples and for yeah. being here to tell us about this process. I'm a Wenatchee native, so I grew up all around the orchards. And like you, like you said, I self-identify as an apple snob, but I never <laughs> knew why I liked the ones I like. So I, now I'll at least be able to explain my preferences. <laughs> yeah, I love knowing the background on that. If you guys go, if you want to just like kind of, I don't know, explore the different ways that we describe apple flavors, because we used to just say, oh, it's a sweet apple or it's a tart apple, right? So um, like with Kanzi, when I said like at first you're like, oh, it's sour, and then it kind of mellows out. Um, we have, if you go to, it's flavogram.com, it's F-L-A-V-O-G-R-A-M.com. You can kind of see our new way it's kind of like a wine tasting kind of way that we're doing apples. Um, so if you guys want to look, get that a look, see, and then maybe you can pick out some of your favorite varieties that you want to pick up at the store next time you're there. It's pretty helpful. I'm feeling like apple tasting is very fancy now. First of all, you use the we're grape, trying. right? You told us that it's extra fancy and that we're rating it like wine. I'm feeling, <laughs> feeling like I want to start grading my outfits that way too. This one's extra fancy. This yeah, one's fancy. <laughs> I know. It's so true. It's so true. But it's, it's so confusing, right? I mean, we couldn't even tell the difference between, you know, the Fuji and the Honeycrisp, and we know they're two very different apples. But, you know, I'm a, I consider myself a professional. You eat apples often, and it's still hard. Can you think of the people that are grocery shopping and, and they don't know the difference? So we're trying to make it easy by giving kind of a flavor experience. So you guys should check it out because it's pretty- So cool. much fun. I just put that link um, in chat too. Danielle, is there anything else you want to share um, with our viewers before we close out? I don't think so. Thank you, everyone, for letting me talk for 45 minutes. <laughs> really appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to our guests for joining us tonight for this virtual tasting. Um, I also want to say thank you for supporting the museum through your ticket sales tonight. We depend on your support, support especially now, and we're just really working hard to um, serve our mission to engage and educate while our doors are closed. We just really appreciate your support. So until we can all be back together again, we're thankful for this opportunity to, um, to gather as a community virtually. I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.